Greetings, welcome to Calculus 1, Chapter 2, Section 7, where we're going to talk about derivatives and rates of change. And in this particular section, I have a, a number of slides that I want to go through, and some of them we're going to blow right past them. But at the end of looking at these slides, we're going to go in and look at a couple of homework problems and talk about the approach to solving those. <clears throat> Excuse me, the reason why I'm not going to look at all of these slides with you is because some of them are a bit redundant, some of them are talking about the sort of the story behind the ultimate formula, which is going to be the one most beneficial to you. And I don't think that we need to be spending too much time on the backstory. I want to sort of cut to the chase a little bit. So for example, this slide is talking about finding, I mean, we're starting our conversation about tangent lines and tangents. And what we're looking at here is a formula for essentially finding the slope of a line between two points. Here's your first point. If I turn on my pen, this is x1, or rather x2, and this is y2. This is, let's try that again. This is x2 and x1. This is y2 and y1. So you know that slope is equal to rise over run or change in y divided by change in x. So we don't need to spend a lot of time talking about that. What we do need to talk a little bit about is how it is that we're going about using that idea in order to find the slope of a tangent line. And what it is that we do in order to facilitate that is initially, if we fix a point P on a, on a graph or on a curve, and then we have a second point, maybe this we could call point number two, so that would have a coordinates x2, y2, and if we keep moving that point Q closer and closer to point P, what happens is that the slope of the secant line, or the line that's crossing our graph at two points, the slope of that secant line gets closer and closer to the slope of the tangent line, again, as point Q gets closer and closer to point P. And if I can draw in a point Q that's even closer to point P. There it is. Let me throw a straight edge on here and try to sketch this line for us. Right, that purple line that I just drew has a slope that's really close to the slope of the tangent line at point P. So if we can get point P and point Q really close together, uh, and in fact, infinitesimally close together, then we're gonna have a great idea, or actually an exact value, for the slope of the tangent line that passes through point P. And how we're going to do that is, point P has an X coordinate, and point Q has an X coordinate, and the difference between those X coordinates, essentially, or eventually, we're going to call it H. Lowercase h is gonna represent that difference in X values. And it won't be a surprise for you to hear that we're going to use our study of limits and the limit laws in order to send the value of h toward zero. So here we're getting even closer to uh, the use of that value of h. It's x minus a. It's the difference in those two x coordinates that's eventually going to bring points p and q really close together, and that x minus a is going to be our h value. And as a gets really close to x, in terms of numerical values, x minus a is going to approach zero. So what we're gonna say is that h is approaching zero. Another thing that, uh, that we see in these notes is there's this uh, not a fixation so much, but the idea of going directly at 
working on finding the slope of the tangent line that passes through a particular point. So you're seeing a specific x coordinate of a and the resulting y coordinate by taking a and plugging it into our function. As we go through, I'll, I'll make sort of a game time decision, but my guess is that what I'd like to do is try to do this process in generality instead of always targeting a specific point. Now I have to go target my cat and get her out of here. You're so noisy. Come on, go play. Go on. Are you staying? Are you going? What are you doing? She's going. She'll meow to come back here in about 30 seconds. So for example, in this first problem, we're working with this function, y equals x squared, and immediately we have a concern for a particular point. So our a value, which is actually an x coordinate, is going to be one, and we're going to be in this limit down here. You can see that we're sending our x value toward one. <clears throat> now the one in that limit statement is lowercase a. That's a fixed value. That's uh, in the diagram that we were looking at previously, that was point P, so that's the fixed one. And point Q actually has this X coordinate that we're gonna be bringing in closer and closer to the X value or the A value of one. And here we are calculating the slope between those two points, P and Q, so to speak. And here's your point P, here's your point Q x2 comma y2. Now we're actually taking our function of x squared and dropping that in for f of x. And in order to evaluate this limit, it's a great idea to get rid of the removable discontinuity of x minus one in the denominator because if we leave it there, it causes division by zero. So we factor the numerator, we cancel out the x minus ones, we're left with just x plus one, and now we can evaluate this limit by direct substitution and we get two. And what two means is uh, that two is the slope of the tangent to the curve at the point one comma one. We can use that slope then of two and bring it down and plug it into point slope form for the equation of a line and we can actually engineer the equation of that specific tangent line. So there's our m value or the slope of our tangent. Here's x1, here's y1, and then we could distribute, combine like terms, move some things around and write our equation for the tangent line in slope intercept form. Now thankfully, you already know how to manipulate your limits quite well. This is just a different application. Uh, this is an illustration of, this is our parabola coming out of the origin here and swinging up through the point one, one. And if we were to zoom in on this graph, you can see that this graph looks less curvy, so to speak. And if we zoom in really close, geez, that looks a whole lot like a line. And one of the ways that we can express uh, or try to articulate what it is that we're doing here is we're trying to zoom in on this particular event, this particular point where we have an x value of one and determine the slope or the rate of change, right? Change in y over change in x, the rate of change of our function. And the way that we refer to that is by the slope of the tangent line. But what we're really doing is finding the instantaneous rate of change at a particular point on a graph or for a function. The more we zoom in, the more it looks like a line, right? See, we don't need to read that. And here it is. Here's where we're changing our x minus a in the denominator of the difference quotient to this value of h. Then we don't have to send x to our a value, right? Because if x and a were equal to each other, this would be zero. So as x approaches a, it's our h value that's approaching zero. 
So it lets us consolidate this a little bit. We talked about this diagram already pretty much. Uh, here's our fixed point that has a fixed x coordinate of a. Our second point q has an x coordinate of a plus h. And as h gets closer and closer to zero, these two x coordinates are going to get closer and closer to each other. Or really, it's the point q that's moving closer and closer to point p. And we're making that happen by changing q's x-coordinate so that it's more and more similar or numerically closer and closer to the x-coordinate of point p. This is everything that I just said which eventually delivers us to this definition <clears throat> or this version of definition 1 which says that m, the slope of the tangent line, can be determined by taking the limit as h approaches 0. And then we get into a little bit more applied of a conversation where we're talking about velocity. But before we can talk about velocity, be aware that it's very frequent that a position function, s, is expressed as a function of time. So that's what this says. S is our position function. That's what, why the S is on the left-hand side of that equation. And f of t is simply saying that on the right-hand side we've got some kind of a function where t is the, um, it's not the, it's the independent variable, sorry. Mm-hmm, yep, right. So here we are looking at our s values. We've got a position when time equals a. We have a position when time is equal to a plus h. How far apart are those two points in time? Well, they have a difference of h. But if we make h smaller and smaller, then the two positions that we're inspecting are at almost the same point in time. And so previously we were talking about average rate of change. Now as we talk specifically about velocity, we're talking about average velocity. So this is just a specific example of the previous more generalized topic we started talking about. Velocity or speed, and we'll narrow that definition down a little bit in a moment. If you think about velocity as being miles per hour, how many miles did I travel, divided by how much time did it take me to travel that distance? And we could do examples using uh, mile markers on the interstate and how long did it take me from, you know, from one o'clock to three o'clock? Well, three minus one is equal to, to two, so that would be our change in time, and we could subtract the larger mile marker from the a lower valued mile marker and be able to figure out our total displacement or our distance traveled. So this is still change in y divided by change in x, except it's a more specific example now where it's a change in displacement divided by change in time. And we're seeing the same diagram just with a very slight difference here where it says average velocity instead of average rate of change. Mm -hmm. Great, we're still going to be moving point Q so that, so that it's closer to point P. And this is valuable. As we let our H value approach zero, we're going to be defining velocity or the instantaneous velocity or instantaneous rate of change at a particular time where T is equal to A. All right, so here this looks exactly the same as what we've been seeing, except that the left-hand side of this equation says V of A. <clears throat> v for velocity. The right-hand side of this equation, however, 
is using the function named f. But really, if we're talking about velocity, which is a change in position divided by a change in time, this function f, thought I was still using my highlighter there, this function f should really say s because this is the position function. Remember, it's a change in position in the numerator or a change in displacement. And so we've seen this example where we talked about dropping a ball from the top of the CN tower, which I don't recommend, but riding up in the glass elevator, I definitely recommend. Standing on the clear paneled floor when you're 450 meters above the ground, not for the faint of heart. I was a little timid. There were five-year-olds jumping up and down on the glass though, so you have to decide which one of those two types of people you are. It's pretty trippy to be looking down through a glass for floor at 450 meters. And we talked about what's the velocity of a ball after five seconds if you were to just drop it from the observation deck. And then a follow-up question of how, fall about ball, how fast the ball is traveling when it hits the ground. And here, here's the S showing up again. Instead of saying S of T, we're just saying that position is a function of time so that we can be consistent in our notation, F of T. And it's equal to 4.9 times t squared. 4.9 is the rate of acceleration due to gravity as measured in meters per second squared. So that's where the 4.9 comes from. That's not arbitrary. And our velocity equation here can be determined by taking the limit as h goes to 0, where we have our difference in position divided by the difference in time. And again, we're taking that point P, fixing it, sliding point Q really close to it. How close? Almost zero close. Okay, very, very small difference between those two values. And then let's apply this to our specific function. So T of H is being plugged in for T here, which means it's being plugged in for T here, which is why it no longer says 4.9 T squared. Instead, it says 4.9 t plus h squared. And the function t is being replaced here with the actual function. And then if we FOIL the t plus h squared and we factor this 4.9 out, out front, not necessary to do it that, boy, that way, but in this illustration the 4.9 has been factored out of all four of the resulting terms. And then if we combine like terms, and you should go through this process. You, you need to be good at using the difference quotient, taking the t plus h or x plus h or whatever it is, plugging it into your function, processing the arithmetic, doing the algebra, squaring the binomial, combining like terms, staying organized, all right? Uh, and then this should happen, right? The term that's coming from the f of t function when you're using the difference quotient, that term should always cancel out with an earlier term, and here that is happening. So those two terms cancel out, and we're left with this statement. The nice part about this statement is that the two terms in the numerator both contain a factor of h. So one at the very top of your screen, this h here, and one of these h's are gonna be factored out, and we see that factor appearing here outside of the parentheses. Again, it's not a necessary step. You could just as easily at the top of your screen have distributed your division and canceled out an H from each one of those terms. But here we see, we see the H factored out so that it's very clear that what we're reducing or canceling out is one factor of H from the top and the bottom, which leaves us with this expression which is effectively a polynomial, and we can solve it by direct substitution, plugging in the h for zero, and we get a result of 9.8t. Well, that was fun, wasn't it? What the heck was all of that? We use the position function at the top of your screen, 
and we said that its corresponding velocity equation is equal to the limit as h goes to zero where the difference quotient has been applied to our position function. That, that's uh, generically, and here we're actually using the position function. So what we just did is we started with the position function, used the limit and the difference quotient in order to achieve a velocity function. This is great because this is not yet specifically being applied. This is not yet being applied to a specific point in time. That's what we're gonna do in, the, in really the next part of part A, or the next step in part A, because we were asked for the velocity after five seconds. Now we can take that five and plug it into our velocity equation, which we just figured out was 9.8t. Here's the five being plugged into that uh, equation, and we get a result of 49 meters per second. So that is the velocity of the ball dropped from the observation deck of the CN Tower five seconds into its fall. I was gonna say flight, but it's not really much of a flight. It's really just a fall. Part B was asking us for the velocity of the ball when it hits the ground. How fast is the ball traveling when it hits the ground? Since the observation deck is 450 meters up, when the ball hits the ground, that's going to be happening when your position is equal to 450. That might seem a little counterintuitive. Shouldn't the uh, position of my ball be zero when it hits the ground? Mm -hmm that's going to change from time to time. It depends on whether the position function that you're being given is expressing height above the ground or a height above its uh, an object's launching position. So here what we're really looking at with this s of t function is, and it's funny, all of a sudden now it's being presented as s of t, right, instead of uh, f of t. What we're really looking at with this function is displacement, how far we are away from our starting position. And when the ball hits the ground, for sure you're going to be 450 meters away from your starting position. So that's why we're setting the function equal to 450. And which function is it that we're setting equal to 450? Again, it's the position function. Why are we doing that? So that we can figure out, dividing both sides by 4.9, square rooting both sides, it's so that we can get the time necessary for the ball to reach the ground. Now that we know how long it's going to take to get there, we can take just the same way we did with the number 5, we can take the number 9.6, or precisely the square root of 450 over 4.9, and we can plug that into our velocity equation. It's always better to do your rounding at the very end so we are plugging that exact value into the velocity function. Then here's that value being multiplied by the 9.8, again from our velocity function. And then we get our final answer of approximately 94 meters per second. This is a very common uh, Calc 1 type of a question as you first start learning about derivatives or slope of tangent lines, or instantaneous rates of change, right? All of these are pretty much synonymous. Uh, you're also gonna see problems like that for sure in a physics class, if you're launching a projectile or something like that, um, hitting a golf ball or a baseball, throwing a football, launching a missile, firing a cannonball, right? The, the options are endless. Here's our statement again, okay? It's generalized again, we're back to using the function f. h is being sent equal to zero. And as the previous slide was saying, this process is used so frequently that it's given a specific name. When we go through these motions, we call it finding the derivative of a function. 
Sometimes we're just finding the derivative of a function, f. Sometimes we go further, usually we go a step further, and then evaluate that function at a particular number. In the previous problem, we plugged in uh, a time value of 5 and then a time value of, I think it was 9.6. What this means as pertains to the conversation about position and velocity, what it means is that the velocity equation was actually the derivative of the position function. Here it is being expressed with the x minus a in the denominator and sending x really, really close to a instead of putting an h in the denominator as you see at the top of your screen and sending h to zero. Equivalent, I would say that this is how you're going to see it most frequently. I lied. This, I'm pretty sure, is how you're going to see it most frequently. But it's good that you know that they're interchangeable. So here you're just being asked point blank to find the derivative of a function. At a number a, you'll also see this uh, question phrased as, here's a function, find the derivative. You won't have to plug in an a. Here they're plugging in some generic actual fixed value. Sometimes you'll just leave that with an x, and then all of these a's will be x's. Just be careful when you're typing an answer in online or choosing it from a multiple choice list that you choose it, uh, especially if you're entering it yourself, that you're typing in using the correct value, x's or a's. Uh, okay, so here's the difference quotient again f of a plus h, so this a plus h right here needs to go in for this x here, which means it's got to go in for this x, and it's got to go in for that x. So this is where I'm saying you should be practicing. You're going to need to do this on your own uh, without just following along with somebody else's pre-written process. So get good at squaring, foiling, combining like terms. Don't forget to distribute the negative along with the 8 when you distribute your multiplication there. Before you combine like terms, to the right of that, make sure you're distributing this minus sign also. When you distribute that minus sign, you get these three terms, starting with a negative a squared. It's those three terms that are coming from this minus f of a. <clears throat> All three of those terms should cancel out with three terms to the left of it. and in fact, positive a squared, negative a squared. Negative 8a, positive 8a. Positive 9, negative 9. They all cancel out. If that doesn't happen, you've made a mistake. You need to go back and check your work or just start with a fresh piece of paper. Once those cancel out, we're left with this statement here. And you'll notice that we have an h in every one of our terms in the numerator, so that's gonna cancel out with this h in the denominator, leaving us just with 2a plus h minus eight. Now we've got a polynomial, let's solve it by direct substitution, h goes to zero, leaving us just with 2a minus eight. Again, you might see a final answer here show up as 2x minus eight, and then you'll simply plug in an actual numerical value instead of a generic a value. Uh, these notes are set up for maybe a classroom experience or a synchronous experience for you to try. If you would like to uh, jot this down and pause the video at this point and maybe try to find the first derivative of this function on your own, I, would, I think that's a great idea. You're going to get to do it in homework also, and there are undoubtedly almost innumerable videos where you can see additional demonstrations of this or look in your textbook, for example, problems of finding the derivative. So there's your function, there's the difference quotient, and we're applying the limit to it. We've made all of our substitutions here. We've already distributed and combined like terms here. 
And this, see this is why I don't like doing this. Look at this. We've got this x minus a in the denominator right here, which means it, it's, we're stuck with it all the way along, which means in the numerator, when it comes time to simplify and get rid of that x minus a, look what you have to do. You gotta go rooting around in here, finding x minus a's, finding x minus a's, so that you can end up with x minus a's that are cancelable, so that you don't have a denominator anymore. If you can avoid using x minus a, avoid it. Just use h, so much simpler, much less convoluted. It's gonna take you to the same final answer, so don't worry about that, but I think it, um, using the h in the denominator keeps things a little cleaner and lessens the chance that you're gonna make an arithmetic error or an algebra, algebraic error. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yep, yep, <clears throat> that's point slope form. Here's y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. So it's point slope form. Find the slope of the tangent to the curve. Okay, so we're given a curve, there it is. We're given a point, it's not a real point, it's a generic point, it's got an x coordinate of a. Uh, all right, I don't wanna do that. Find the equations of the tangent lines at the points. Okay, so this is, essentially we're looking at three problems here. One is, we're gonna to need to find the derivative of our given function. The second thing we need to do is find the equation of the tangent line at a point that has an x coordinate of one. And we will use that y value also. And then the third problem that's here is to do that process again and find the equation of a different tangent line that's tangent to our curve at a point that has an x coordinate of two. And then graph the curve in both tangent lines. You don't want me and my handwriting to write all of this out. So what I'd like to do is step through it with you. You, everything that's on the screen right here, mm -hmm, all of this, you've already seen this process, and thankfully we're using h in the denominator. All right, so uh, let's walk through this. Here's our given function, top uh, part of it's behind my head. There it is. These terms right here on the right hand side are in reverse order from how we normally see them. Normally the cube would be first, the square would be in the middle, and the three as a constant value would be at the end. It's, why is it presented this way? I don't know. Is it okay? Yes, it's okay. Don't worry. Then we're going to take that function and we're going to mix it with the difference quotient over here, and then we'll apply the limit to it in a little while. So you've got to plug in the a plus h. That's what's happening here. And then the right hand side is <clears throat> f of a, and we've plugged in an a into our function. All the x's changed to a's. All right, so just plugging those things in, that's not difficult, super. And then the annoying part, <clears throat> where everything that's I've circled in green, you have to multiply all of that stuff out and distribute some multiplication and combine some like terms, okay, irritating. However, very doable. If you have to do it on your own, just stay super organized, use a sharp pencil, burn a lot of paper if you have to, spread it out, skip lines. I promise you staying organized is gonna be beneficial to you. Yeah, I suppose I wouldn't have necessarily done it this way. Uh, what you're seeing here, I've circled incorrectly. Let me just back up two steps. <laughs> there you go. That's all of the foiling and multi, uh, that's all the foiling. All we've done is squaring the a plus h here and cubing the a plus h 
here. But what happened to, to this stuff over here? The expression has gotten so long that it wrapped onto the next line. Here it is. All right, they just didn't put it all on one line so the text could be larger. But it's all still there, that's all right. And one thing, or, or another thing that they did is How do I get you here? So this minus sign that's right here, that negative or minus sign needs to be distributed into these parentheses like this. Once we get down to here, that distribution has already occurred. You see that the three is negative the 4a squared has a minus sign in front of it instead of a plus sign and it says plus 2a cubed instead of minus 2a cubed and that's because we already distributed the negative then distribute um, this multiplication by 4 that's over here this multiplication by negative 2 combine like terms and we arrive at this lovely statement here at the bottom of your screen this would be a crazy exercise for you to do. It would be crazy in many ways. It would be good because algebraically it's very strenuous and it would really drive home the need for organization. Maybe you want to be using two different colored uh, writing utensils. Instead of circling things in pink and green, you could just write these two different expansions in different colors. And then once you finally get to combine like terms down here, then you could write it all in one color again. Notice that in the numerator there, every one of those terms has an H in it. So we can cancel out one of those H's. Here they elected to factor out the H from all five of those terms so that canceling this H and this H is more evident. And Mm, there should be an equal sign right here. And then finally we've got that as a polynomial. We can solve by direct substitution. Plugging in the h value of 0 leaves us with unbelievable all of that work and all we get are these two little terms down here. What in the world is 8a minus 6a squared? It's the derivative of this equation with an A plugged in for the X's. Why it is that they insist on plugging in an A, I don't know. Could definitely just have left it as an X because the next thing that we're going to do is we are going to plug in a specific X value or A value. And we're gonna get that from what I have the number two pointing at here because we want to know the slope of the tangent line at the point one comma five. And the one is certainly the x-coordinate of that ordered pair. So here, uh, in the bottom left, <clears throat> excuse me, we are plugging the number one into our derivative. And if you plug a one into this statement right here, the result is two. So that is the slope of the tangent line to our curve at the point 1 comma 5. So you're seeing all three elements coming together there. We have our x coordinate of positive 1, our y coordinate of positive 5, and the slope of 2 which we got from plugging the x coordinate into the first derivative. That's point slope form, here it is in slope intercept form. And then below that, you're seeing the exact same process, plugging an x-coordinate of 2 into the function, doing some arithmetic to find out that the slope of the tangent line at the point 2, 3, that slope is equal to negative 8. And then we plug in the x-coordinate of 2, the y-coordinate of 3, and the slope of negative 8, and you've got yourself the equation of the line that is tangent to your curve at the point 2, 3.
Don't I say it so calmly as though it's just a walk in the park? Don't worry. After you do the, a handful of these, and I recommend doing them almost one right after the other. Do one of these problems, take a short break. Do another problem, take a quick break. But keep going through these. You want to get to the point where these problems are only irritating because they're time consuming. But you want to go into these problems knowing that you know what you're doing. You're going to get the right answer. All you have to do is focus and stay organized for long enough to get yourself to that first derivative. Once you get to here, then it's really a walk in the park. Uh, did we not just see this? Yeah, that information is here. Oh, because the instructions were to graph the curve and the two tangent lines. And that's nice. You can see the curve is in blue and the first of our tangent lines at 1 comma 5 is in red and the second one with the negative slope, a slope of negative 8, is the one in black. And obviously the scale on this screen has been adjusted because a slope of negative 8 I would imagine should look considerably steeper than that, but uh, the, the y-axis has undoubtedly been adjusted there. Rates of change, like distance divided by time, or dollars divided by time, a lot of our rates of change are going to be with respect to time. Uh, yeah, change in X. This is the capital Greek letter delta, which represents change. We've seen epsilon delta proofs or delta epsilon proofs. That's a lowercase Greek letter delta, also represents change. Hey, it's the difference quotient. We've seen that before. Hey, look at that. Uh, look at that diagram over there. That looks very familiar. Average rate of change, instantaneous rate of change, slope of a tangent line. Really, it's uh, the instantaneous rate of change and slope of a tangent line that are the ones that are equivalent to each other. And you can see that equal sign there. The, the first statement, average rate of change, is just the slope of the line that passes through PQ. All right, so take note of the fact that those are two equations that are being written over here. The first one is average rate of change equals the slope of the line through separate points, PQ. Instantaneous rate of change is the slope of a tangent line which passes through only one point. Position, velocity, instantaneous rate of change, taking the change in x and sending it to zero. That's the same as change in x. That's your h value, OK? That's lowercase. That's x minus a. Here they're calling it uh, x2 minus x1 instead of x minus a. All the same stuff, just different presentations of it calling it instantaneous rate of change here instead of just calling it a lowercase m. And there's this, n this notation, f prime of x. So the first derivative is denoted by just putting this little sort of s straight line next to the name of your function. So you could see f prime of x, g prime of x. That's not a very good prime, right? So it should be a straight line. <clears throat> h prime of x, it's not a parenthesis, or it's not a, an apostrophe, okay? It's definitely a sort of a straight mark, as you're seeing here. Here. Uh, all right. What else do I have for you? This. We now have a second interpretation. I can't handle any more interpretations. The derivative f prime is the instantaneous rate of change of y equals f of x with respect to x when x equals a. Wasn't that helpful? No, probably not. Blot that out of your mind. What's the first derivative? It's a new function that when you plug in an x value returns an instantaneous rate of change or the slope of a tangent line. The slope of which tangent line? 
the slope of the tangent line to the curve at the point that has the x coordinate that you just plugged into the derivative. The first derivative is synonymous with the instantaneous rate of change. The instantaneous rate of change when? When x equals whatever number it is that you're plugging into the first derivative function. All right, don't make it overly complicated. Sometimes this, this math speak down here leaves you more bewildered than you need to be. What, this, what you're seeing in this blue rectangle right here is just hyper-specific language. So specific that sometimes it's not helpful. If I see instantaneous rate of change again, I'm gonna lose my mind. I can't handle that diagram anymore. Mm -hmm. When the derivative is small, the curve is relatively flat. Sure, because if you have a slope that's like 0.1, yeah, your curve at that point is going to be relatively horizontal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If your original function is the position function, then the first derivative is the velocity function. At a particular point t, which particular point t? I don't know. You haven't plugged in an actual number yet. Here they just insist on plugging in a again. Uh, we're 46 minutes in, which means like 42 minutes ago I said the word speed, and I was going to clarify that a little bit. Speed is absent direction. Velocity can be positive or negative, and a negative would indicate maybe that you're going backwards or that you're going down whereas a positive velocity would indicate that you're going up. Uh, a positive velocity could mean that you're moving to the right, and a negative one means you're going left, all right? But if you're just talking about speed, no one's asking you about direction. At least, they shouldn't be. So in this example, we've got a manufacturer that's producing bolts of fabric. A bolt is like a big roll uh, with a fixed width the cost is represented by C. X is measured in yards. So C is really been being measured in dollars. Is should I, is I should have also highlighted that. Okay. So what is the meaning of the derivative of f prime of x? What are its units? The first derivative is talking about a rate of change. I've used miles per hour uh, as an example. We saw the CN tower example where it was meters per second. Rise over run, change in y divided by change in x, change in displacement divided by change in time, meters per second, okay? In this case, what two units are we looking at? Dollars and yards, really. And if x is measuring yards, then rise over run, which is usually change in y over change in x, in this case, change in x is being is measuring a change in yards, which means that our y value, or the rise, which is going to be on our y-axis, is measuring dollars. So what's the meaning of the first derivative? It's the rate of change as measured in dollars per yard. That's really answering the question, what are its units? Dollars per yard. What's the meaning of it? The cost of producing x yards is a function of the number of yards of fabric that you're producing. The more yards of fabric you produce, either the greater or uh, lower, the cost is going to be. So the first derivative is measuring the change in cost to produce x yards of fabric. 
In practical terms, what does it mean to say that f prime of 1,000 equals 9? Remember that this 9 is dollars per yard, and it means that at the point where you're producing 1,000 yards of fabric, your cost or your change in cost per yard of fabric is still increasing at a rate of nine dollars per yard. Now, what do you think the cost would have been? Well, yeah, do you, do you think, which, which one of these do you think is greater? How do I ask this question? Uh, let me use an example that's a little bit more practical. If you were gonna go and have t-shirts made for an event at a t-shirt screen printing company, and you went in and said, uh, I don't think anyone's gonna show up to my event, so I only need to have one shirt made. The person behind the counter might say, well, once you get us the design and everything, uh, and we add in the cost of the shirt, it'll cost you $103. $103 for one shirt? Sure thing. Why is that? Because they have to make the screen in order to do the printing. That's $100 worth of the cost. Three bucks is just a cost of, uh, you know, some of the ink that they're putting on the shirt and the cost of the shirt, which is cheap, okay? What does it cost to have two shirts made? What if my mom wants to come with me to the event? Well, then it'll be $106. So it ends up being like $3 per person. Well, once the event gets big and you've got 100 people coming or 200 people coming, the cost to produce each shirt is going to go down because you're able to order the shirts in bulk, you can order the ink that you're using to do the printing in bulk, and the cost per shirt will end up going down. In part B in this question, what we're seeing is that the cost per yard is still on the rise. It's rising at a cost of $9 per yard. So I would say that F prime of 50, the cost to produce each yard, I have no idea what it costs to produce a yard of fabric, but it's gotta be a pretty detailed process. That's probably a really large number, F prime of 50, as you're getting your production up and running. You've gotta have the machines and the staff and a warehouse and so on. F prime of 500, and once you start cranking out some volume, my guess is that the rate of increase in cost to produce a yard is probably starting to come down a little bit. Okay, this is the, the one that maybe, you know, if F prime of 1,000 was equal to nine, maybe F prime of 500 is still like 14. Uh, and maybe F prime of 50 was like 70, okay? Because you're still getting things uh, up and running. And then what about F prime of 1,000? Now, I'm a little bit out of my element here because I don't know all that much about manufacturing or manufacturing costs. You could give me equations for it and we could talk about marginal cost and things like that and, and take derivatives and calculate averages and so on. But what we find out here is that once you get into mass production and you have to take things to the next level, it's very possible that you're gonna endure some additional costs. Maybe you have to get another warehouse or maybe shipping becomes um, more of an ordeal so it's very possible that once you get to the point where you're producing or manufacturing 5,000 yards of fabric, that the cost per yard of fabric actually starts to increase because you're operating a larger organization and there are additional costs that come along with that. So this was very much a kind of a conceptual conversation we don't even know what our function is in this particular case, but realize that as in this example, that the cost per yard of fabric could start out, if X is measuring the, the number of yards of fabric that we're producing, and this is the rate of increase in cost per yard of fabric. Okay, now my vertical axis is C prime it might start out that we're, it costs us $70 per yard uh, early in our manufacturing process, but 
as we produce more and more, that cost might come down to, this is, the scale is messed up on the left hand side, but when we hit that 500 mark, maybe it comes down to nine. But then as we're producing more and more, it might even flatline for a while here. But at some point in time, as we have to scale up our operation, that cost per yard might increase, all right? And again, these slides are set up with some you try it examples. Uh, we're just calculating the slope between two different points, doing a bit of averaging of some different slopes. Uh, that's not too heavy. So that uh, ends our conversation about the derivative and some of the uh, uh, different ways that we can apply a use of the derivative. So I'm going to uh, post this as a two-part series about this lesson and in my next considerably shorter video about this section, I will go through some homework problems and talk about an approach to solving some problems that are presented a little bit differently. So I'll see you there. Thanks.